We're all, everyone's comfortable. You can all see me and you can all hear me okay. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Alexandra Giordano. A lot of you know me as Sasha. I'm the assistant director of the Hofstra University, assistant director for exhibition and collection at the Hofstra University Museum of Art. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to thank our museum director, Karen Albert, for giving me the opportunity to curate the exhibition, When We All Stand. And I want to thank our staff, who really helped making the exhibition a success. I also want to thank the Cultural Center. They helped support um, this event, the event for this evening. So tonight's public programming is planned in conjunction with the exhibition, When We All Stand. The exhibition examines the collective power of the arts to chart a pathway for social change, the role of the artist as activist, and the impact on local communities and nationwide. Five of the artists from the exhibition are here with us this evening, and I thank them so much, as I have all year repeatedly, for their continued support of the exhibition. Lastly, I would like to introduce and thank Phil Dalton, he is an associate professor of rhetoric and public advocacy here at Hofstra, and he is the director for the Center of Civic Engagement. He has graciously agreed to be our moderator this evening, and I leave you in his hands for the rest of the night. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here with us tonight. Uh, as was stated, my name is Phil Dalton, a professor of rhetoric and public advocacy, and I also direct Hofstra's Center for Civic Engagement. Uh, I'd also like to uh, extend thanks to Hofstra Museum of Arts Director Karen Albert and Assistant Director Sasha Giordano. And um, I want to say that I'm really honored to be moderating this uh, event with these tremendously accomplished artists with us. My path to moderating this event is an indirect one. Uh, as a scholar of rhetoric, I study public argument. And one project I conducted was of a controversy focused on a mural that was rejected by the community in which it was placed. And while that's not unheard of, in the instance I studied, it was an anti-racism mural that was rejected by many of the community's members of color and was ultimately removed and I bring it up because what the artists who are with us tonight do is very complex. Their work aspires to make us question and seek to change our world, a world that we take for granted, a world that we've grown comfortable and familiar with, or a world that sometimes presents us with problems and injustices that just seem insurmountable. In my writing, I considered murals from the standpoint of a, a form of persuasion termed epideictic. Epideictic rhetoric is a form of persuasion that amplifies community values. It's done by praising people and actions that exemplify community values and by condemning those that do the opposite. And when teaching public speaking, we often reduce epideictic public talk to what we call speeches of praise or blame. Then we go about giving examples of praise. Uh, giving awards, introductions, or eulogies. We offer very little training, however, in the art of condemning and criticizing people, values, actions, and systems, while keeping an eye toward the community values we wish to amplify. The art of pulling that off, of criticizing that which in our world calls for condemnation, involves... Thank you. Um, the art of pulling that off, of criticizing that which in our world calls for condemnation involves careful attention to chosen images, attention to style uh, or treatment of those images, image meanings within the community, the technical ability of the artist to execute their vision, and the credibility of the artists themselves. And with us today are five people who've succeeded at what James Baldwin, who I mentioned because evidently James Baldwin's work, um, the creative process, was an inspiration for this showing. Um, 
he descri- uh, what he described in the essay in that essay was there being ceaselessly ceaselessly warring with society, but not to tear it down, but to make it more just. So allow me then to introduce our our guests. We have with us Molly Crabapple, um, Carly Fisher of Four Freedoms, an artist organization that encourages participation through the arts, Miguel Luciano, Michelle Pred, and Sophia Victor. And the way we'll proceed is that I'll ask each artist to come speak about their work for three to five minutes. And to keep us on schedule, uh, I will sit over there and, and indicate when we've reached uh, five minutes, uh, at which time I'll ask you to, to move on to the next speaker. Um, and then afterwards, we'll raise the screen and take seats here and uh, begin a discussion with you all. I brought questions as well. So with that said, allow me to introduce Molly Crabapple. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna come out from behind this, uh, this thing. I'm very short, and I feel like it'll block me. Thank, thank you so much to Hofstra for having me here, and thank you to all of you in the audience who could have done everything else this night, from getting drunk to hanging out with your friends, and yet you're listening to us artists talk. I appreciate you all. So I uh, do a small and interesting niche. I am an artist who uses her sketch pad the way that a photojournalist might use their camera. I travel all around the world uh, to places where conflict is happening, where people are on the streets, where bombs are falling, where powerful bastards are bringing down the boot on people who don't deserve it. Uh, places like uh, Ukraine or the Gaza Strip or uh, you know re- refugee camps in Lebanon or in Greece. And also, of course, on the streets of America, whether it's at the uh, U.S.-Mexican border, where children were being ripped away from their mothers, or whether it was in New York City, where these pictures were drawn uh, during the days of the George Floyd uprising, a time when after months of mass death via COVID, after a brutal lockdown where streets were like the apocalypse, and after horrific incidents of police brutality against uh, black folks in the name of uh, enforcing COVID regulations. It was a time when people rose up and they said, we will not be terrorized by these thugs in blue. The city is ours and these streets belong to us. And I was there and I documented it. Now, I have to admit, despite being in this show, I don't consider myself an activist. I've always had a, a slight discomfort with the word activism. I thought it was both too rarefied and also um, gave one an excuse not to participate. But when I say too rarefied, I mean, I know I know real organizers like uh, Mariame Kaba. She goes uh, by a prison culture on Twitter, uh, one of the great like prison abolitionist organizers. She gives her life to this stuff. I'm not going to say I'm an activist like Mariame Kaba is. But the second reason that I've always rejected the word is that I don't think that trying to make stuff a little bit better and a little bit more fair makes you a special sort of person called an activist. I think it's the rent that you pay on living in this world, and I think it's something that we all should do. So activist to me seems like a way of saying, this is for special other people. Just, you know, an activist does things to make things better. A chef cooks things, and I just sit on my ass and consume. I don't agree with that. Now... I only have three minutes, and so I'm just going to talk about this piece, because it was uh, a moment that I remember so well. It was midway in um, the middle of the uprising in 2020. I was walking down Broadway in the financial district, and there was this uh, you know, state courts van with um, FTP, we all know what that stands for, written on it. And these young kids were there, and they were so happy, because these kids, right, They had just seen all of this death. They had seen police being more violent than they had ever been in New York City. And the New York City cops are thugs, so this is quite a high bar. They had just seen all of that. But for one moment, right, the power was gone, and the streets belonged to them, and they were the kings of the world. And there they were, standing atop that police van, like this city was theirs, as it should be, taking their pictures. And I went by and I asked the kid on the van if I, could, if I could take his picture to draw him. And he said, sure, it's going to get you 10 million likes on Facebook. 
and then he posed for me just like that. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm Carly Fisher. I'm here on behalf of Four Freedoms, which is an organization that works at the intersection of arts and civic engagement. And I am a curator and a producer at Four Freedoms, but in many ways, like, we are both a very traditional artist collective and totally not a traditional artist collective. We're an organization that's founded by a lot of artists who began with the question, what would it look like if artists made a super PAC? And it was in this moment of thinking about, like, how it is that we think about our legacies of power and particularly the influence of money in politics and then also what is the role of the artist in our most urgent civic conversation. So the organization sort of began as a super PAC and over time became a million other things. And one of the like key initial projects and the impetus of the name of the organization for Freedoms um, are these incredible paintings by Norman Rockwell, which depict the uh, four freedoms that FDR ascribed in a speech, where he talks about freedom from want, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom from fear. And these as being sort of like the key tenets of what we all deserve in American society or in any real civic society. And what we did as an organization was reframe these initial images. And I'm, you're seeing four of them, which are examples of each of the four freedoms, but there are actually multiple images of each of the freedoms that we made with a like huge cohort of artists and creatives, friends, thinkers, scholars, people of all different backgrounds who we felt like were at these key intersections of what it looked like to be making the world a better place. And so much of what the organization I think stands for and so much of what drives us is this idea that in our most urgent questions in the world, we need imagination. And artists are people who bring into being things that have never existed, who imagine something that doesn't exist yet in the world and brings it to life. And in order for us to live in a civic society that has new rules that we each feel inspired to live by, we require the same kind of imagination that artists have. So, you know, I, I sort of started by saying, like, we started as one thing and we became a lot of other things. And that is so deeply because our problems are always changing. We're constantly seeing like a new challenge that has emerged in the world and then looking to artists who we collaborate with who are saying, okay, here's a new way to think about imagining what the solution or what the world could look like in spite of that. And actually, we've had the honor of working with three of the four other panelists. Sophia, we haven't had the chance to work together yet, but literally soon. But, you know, as an organization, like we're, we're constantly thinking about like the bigger tent that the more people you welcome in the more ideas you're going to have and so with that in mind actually in 2020 we kind of birthed this collective movement called the wide awakes which was inspired by an activist movement from 1860 which was a movement that among other things really worked to get lincoln elected and it was an abolitionist movement and it was this collective grassroots uprising of young people who were interested in, th in sort of putting abolition on the ballot. And they felt like Lincoln might be a tool to help do that. And along with activists like Frederick Douglass, the Wide Awakes really like were a huge factor in this ma massive election. So in 2020, with another like existential election happening, we thought about what a contemporary iteration of the Wide Awakes might be. And the answer was like, creatives. It would be artists and it would be thinkers and people who were making things and bringing joy. And so we kind of said like, let's make something out of the wide awake. So we didn't know what it was going to be. And the question was like, what would it look like if we all collaborated? And the answer was that there would be mo more opportunities for all of us to collaborate. That like the actual like making of the network, this bringing of people together would be an opportunity to continue to bring people together. And so um, this is on Wide Awakes Day in 2020, where we had this incredible march through New York City. And I just wanted to bring up this, this image to, to talk about the ways in which like art making is so, isn't always as traditional as putting things on the wall. And that community actually can be art, that like the fostering of joy and this 
the ability of art to bring joy to people, but also that joy can in, in, its, in and of itself be a civic act um, is a real opportunity for all of us. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to be among people I love and admire. Um, and I will pass it to... You're great. Hi, uh, thank you guys for being here. I'm also super honored to be with this group. It's a great show uh, with a lot of folks who uh, have known each other and worked together or overlapped with each other in different ways. So we will talk about that later. Um, I, I'm showing a few images that are related to the work in the show um, of my work. Uh, I am uh, a sculptor, painter. Uh, I also uh, have produced a number of socially engaged public art projects and I'm very interested in work that can exist in public space, outside of museums, away from museums <laughs> and galleries entirely, um, with, with intention. And, and so uh, it, for me, I think a lot of work goes to die in museums and uh, in spaces where the work often becomes static and kind of devoid, like the life gets sucked out of the work oftentimes. And some of that has to do with the history of how museums are built uh, and for whom they're built. Um, and some of it you know, has to do with um, I think the idea that art can also be this thing that's dynamic and living and interactive and that makes more sense in the space of, of, of community, right, or in public space. And so um, so I, I like going back and forth, you know, thinking a lot about those dynamics. And this, this project um, that is on screen was a project called Dreamer Kites. And it was in D.C. in, uh, in 2012, uh, in between Obama's first and second administration, um, or between his two terms, rather. And um, it relates to a project that I've been doing for a number of years involving kites and flying kites uh, as a, a way of thinking about flying and freedom. And it's a project that began with young people, especially, um, uh, who would be able to produce a kite with a life-size image of themselves and eventually you know, raise that kite into the air and, and have this experience where they see themselves flying. And so that's, that's where this project began, and, and, and really with my own fantasies of wanting to fly and, and remembering sort of like those <laughs> kinds of dreams. Um, but as I've traveled with this project, um, it, it starts with handmade paper kites, which is a disappearing tradition. I'm from Puerto Rico originally, and so it's something that my parents and grandparents grew up with, but I'm of the plastic kite generation, and so I never learned that uh, growing up. So I relearned it as an adult by having elders teach me and teach people younger than me how to reconnect with that tradition. And it's something that's passed on. And um, in uh, places like New York City, where I'm from, you saw a lot of young Puerto Rican kids who came in the 50s and 60s flying kites on the rooftop, you know, recreating island traditions in the city with handmade paper kites, again. Um, but communing with the sky and thinking about freedom. And so in D.C., I had the privilege of working with an incredible group of, of young activists, young undocumented activists, who um, were, uh, I, was, I was working with Culture Strike as an organization um, that's an art and activist organization that works specifically on issues of immigration in this country, and, um, and with a uh, show called The Ripple Effect, <coughs> excuse me, in D.C., at uh, a museum that was right on the mall, the National Mall. So. Um, we, we pitched doing this project on the National Mall and went through the process of getting permits, et cetera, and then kind of worked around those permits to bring this closer and closer to the White House and to uh, the National Monument. And it was young, undocumented people who participated flying their own images in the nation's capital, very, very close to these national symbols of freedom, right? Um, trying to uh, raise awareness about the DREAM Act, trying to get comprehensive uh, immigration reform, uh, to move in D.C. Uh, and so um, this is Sonia Guinansaka, who uh, at the time was a Hunter College student, undocumented uh, student at Hunter and at CUNY, undocumented students got support in New York City, uh, who was uh, flying her kite on the National Mall. Sonia went on to, uh, she's an incredible artist herself, um, writer, uh, author, very accomplished and published now. She went on to become the director of Culture Strike originally, and now she's like a nationally recognized artist and poet and um, and and leader. Uh, so, um, this is Sonia uh, in Dreamer Kites in the National Mall. I think we have another slide here, and this is Francisco, and this is one of the works that's in the show. And so, Francisco uh, is also a writer, um, so someone who's also leveraging his voice. Um, and uh, you know, when we make the kites. Um, I teach everybody how to make the kite during the first week. 
and then I photograph everyone, and I and I tell folks you can pose, pose however you want. This is your image. It's your kite. Uh, whoever makes the kite keeps it afterwards. So I, I come back with pictures and, and stories, but um, w everybody takes back the kite with them. And so um, this was this is the way Francisco wanted to see himself in the air on the National Mall. And so, um, you know, literally shouting, right, uh, uh, at the administration, <laughs> at the government. And, um, and Francisco came last week to see this in person. I hadn't seen it since we did this. I hadn't seen him, and we hadn't seen this together since we did the project in D.C. So that was very special last weekend that we got to reconnect after like 10 years. Um, Francisco's living in Puerto Rico now. He's an amazing uh, writer. Um, and so the next slide. And this is the other project that I have in the show. On the left-hand side, is these are very different projects, but on the left-hand side is, is, are these sculptures um, that relate to a postographic from the Young Lords uh, in New York from the 1960s. So if you don't know who the Young Lords were, on the right-hand side is a photograph of one of the members of the Young Lords. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cropped photograph by Hiram Maristani, who was one of the founding members of the Young Lords Party in New York City and of the chapter in New York City. The Young Lords were uh, very inspired by the Black Panthers and were like the Puerto Rican version of the Panthers in Chicago and New York in the late 60s. And so um, I, I've been working um, on projects that uh, uh, are dedicated to the Lords and their history. They were, they were warriors for social justice. They were revolutionary activists who took to the streets uh, to reshape our communities um, in ways that could model the practices uh, that the city was not uh, uh, providing for our city. You know? um, so health, food, education, and housing were their platform issues that they worked on. And um, in a famous poster that these sculptures are based on, they had the same graphic, the four rifles um, that became uh, where the issues become the weapons, right, um, that are empowered by our struggle. So the ammunition for our struggle, uh, excuse me, for these issues becomes the struggle itself, right, our action in the streets. And so... Um, they were they were not a, they relieved uh, in freedom for Puerto Rico and the independence of Puerto Rico was one of the major issues that they worked on and so you'll see that on the newspaper here, freedom or death, liberation or death, on one of the Palante newspapers that was the newspaper that they published in the 60s themselves, had radical imagery that was very militant. Um, they were not an armed organization that was uh, like an armed revolutionary organization necessarily, but they were uh, uh, defending everything that they could about their community's interests. And so um, that's, uh, that's health, food, housing, and education that's also represented in the show. Thank you, guys. I'm going to pass the mic to Michelle. Hello. I'm Michelle Pred. Um, thanks for having me here, and thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I'll give you just a, a brief, quick uh, history is that I um, grew up in Berkeley, California. My father was a professor there for over 40 years um, and extremely political. Um, and also I grew up in an era where the freedom of speech movement was taking place. I mean, I was very small, but there was, or young, um, uh, anti-Vietnam War protests, and I was taken to those, um, brought to those when I, you know, in, the, in a uh, stroller. Um, so it's really in my blood. Um, to be political, to respond to what's happening politically in the world. Um, it's very important to me, and it's what I feel like is my um, job. Um, and, and then uh, on this planet, and what is my calling? So um, I learned, you know, y from a young age, even in seventh grade, I sort of think of my first... Uh, my first act of, of changing something that I recognized as um, wrong and not fair, um, I came home and told my father that the, the PE uh, outfits, um, the girls had to wear a uniform and the boys did not for PE. And that's not okay. <laughs> you know, it goes against Title IX. Um, and so he said, well, this, this is what we're going to do. We're going to write a letter and we're going to change it. And it was so simple, but it informed really who I became later in realizing that, you know, you can make a change. That's on a smaller scale, but really, really sort of a teaching moment where you can speak up and make a change. Not everyone feels comfortable 
I feel like it was one of the most lessons, uh, most important lessons I learned. Um, and I think it's so important for especially kids to learn. Um, and so I think that the educational program that you have here is so important to realize everyone has a voice and everyone has a right. I, th I think of it as a civic duty to uh, stand up and, and work you know, against what's wrong in this culture. So um, you'll see my, my physical art pieces in, in the show, or maybe some of you have already seen them, but I'm showing more of my sort of um, social uh, parades and sculptures that I do on a large scale that are in the public eye um, rather than the, my physical art pieces. So this really started in 2016. Um, I started doing feminist art parades, and it really was instigated by the fear of Trump becoming president and responding to um, re the reproductive rights that we were starting to lose already and have been losing for a long time. I've actually been making work about um, pro-abortion first time 30 years ago and I feel like now it's even more important or more important than ever. It's always been important. Um, so this was on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade in 2016. I was really concerned because all of a sudden um, you know, we found out we, Trump was on the ballot along with, at that point, 16 people, and uh, as well as Hillary. And I wanted to do, take an action. This was before the Women's March, before any of that, but I just felt like, let's, let's wear pink and black, and we made some signs. One of the slogans I use a lot is, my body, my business. Um, and uh, the purse says pro-choice. And you d can't see it here, but what I did was I made, actually, you can see one right here. Um, T-shirts that said, her body, her business. Um, put them in envelopes that were transparent and sent them to all 16 candidates. So really, send, and this was on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Um, so we walked from a Planned Parenthood and walked to this main uh, post office in Oakland. And I just, it was a rainy day. I just put a call out on Facebook and I just said, who's available? Come join me. We're going to do this little action. And that sort of was, that's what started it. But um, what what I learned and what goes back to Four Freedoms is that we had a lot of joy too. It was sort of like we're protesting and I almost felt like, is it okay if we're having fun? <laughs> is that okay? I mean, because we're angry too. But um, So I learned that that's really part of activism that's important to me and civic joy. Um, and you can see here, uh, we incorporate a lot of great costumes. And so I, so the, the, first uh, feminist art parade I organized was in 2000, uh, or sorry, the second, uh, 2017 in um, Miami. I did a parade against patriarchy. Um, this was the vote, uh, this is the We Vote Parade in 2018 and before the election, 2018 election. Um, and there's a number of people here that are involved with Four Freedoms. Um, I've done 10 so far um, in Miami, New York, Lon uh, Stockholm, Oakland, San Francisco. So I've, I do them all over the place. Um, but I, I'm based in, in uh, Oakland, California. But it's really about artists creating artwork to carry, um, to wear, and to get the hit the streets. What I also discovered really quickly was that it creates hope, and hope is what we all need to continue. And it really is an important factor in getting through everything that we're trying to get through, and especially with reproductive rights, for example. Um, I've just got the, got the sign. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, a couple other things, but I, I just wanna say that my, my piece also, Love is Activism, is really important. Because if we lead with love, if we work together in love, I think it's essential. Um, another body of work, um, I do a lot of billboards, I organized a nationwide uh, abortion rights billboard show um, last year with 10 artists, or I brought in 10 artists, and um, to send messages to states where abortion is now illegal or heavily restricted. Um, but this is from a project called The Art of Equal Pay, and you could read more about it on theartofequalpay.com and it's about equal pay for women, so that's another big project of mine. Um, and then this is also an example of some of my public work. This is in uh, Miami uh, in December. I decided to, so what, what we need to focus on now is abortion pills. 
that's still possible. It's still possible to have self-managed abortion in all states. You can order them online. And that's a message that I'm really trying to spread a lot. A lot of people don't know that. It's safe. Um, and so this is 56 feet wide. I organized with a group of artists, you can see there, and we drew the abortion pills um, and abortion is a human right in the sand. Um, I've also done that since then in the, s in the snow at Sundance. And then you next slide, you can see here we are. And again, it's the civic joy and fun. Um, uh, I've just started working with, uh, oh, this was my first project I did with Nadia from Pussy Riot, who we're collaborating more together. And um, I'll be back in New York for a uh, uh, fundraiser for, South, uh, for um, Planned Parenthood at Sotheby's. So that's the next project. But again, I just want to sort of really stress the inclusion of community and hope and love and joy in fighting together and working together and moving forward. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Ooh, let me get out of your way. No, you're good. Whew, thank you guys for having me. Where's Sasha? Thank you for everything that you've done. Um, how, where do I start? <coughs> well, I am a artist who understood at the age of 15 when I picked up a paintbrush for the first time that I could paint. Um, it's not something I wanted to do. I wanted to be an actress. I still really want to be on Broadway one day. I just want to be invited. I don't want to have to audition. <laughs> um, and I used to want to play, uh, I used to play the clarinet. And I only got into LaGuardia High School for art, and I was devastated, but that was my top choice school. So I went there thinking that I would switch my major after the first year. And little by little, God began to reveal to me that, like, nope, I put you right where I want you to be. And so that's how I got started painting. Um, this February makes 20 years, which probably feels like a short amount of time in the life of most artists, but it feels like a really long time for me. Um, I believe that my work is Holy Spirit led. Uh, I kind of model my practice after Jesus, who basically spent his life serving other people, ministering to other people. And so I don't, I don't know that activist is the right word, but I do think that ministry just means meeting the needs of someone else. That's, that's all it really is. And so over the past 10 years, or 13 years rather, excuse me, um, I took an African-American history class. Well, I was in SVA where I now teach foundation painting and I'm also second year grad student in their art therapy program. Um, I learned about the Black Panther movement, learned about political prisoners, learned that there were people that had been incarcerated for things they didn't do and left the classroom shaking after that documentary and that basically sent me down a rabbit hole reading different autobiographies and then one day ending up in rooms with real original Panthers and realizing that this was living history. I thought those people had come home and it was just a history I didn't know. And so I started writing letters um, to, for first I started signing birthday cards at um, City College when they used to have these monthly gatherings to political prisoners. And then when I started to write too much in the cards, I was advised to write my own letter. And that's how I started this snail mail, which continues to this day um, 13 years later, um, it turned into me visiting people um, who are political prisoners, working with their family members, trying to raise money for their commissary, trying to ra raise money for them to live comfortably, because by God's grace, since 2010, over 15 people have come home, um, specifically from the Black Panther movement and Black Liberation Movement. Um, and yeah, and then that just kind of led me into everything else that's happened. So I've had the privilege of working closely with the Exonerated Five when they were still suing New York to try to raise money to help pay for their legal fees so that they could continue to sue New York. Um, I've worked closely with mothers and families um, who've lost their children due to police brutality. Um, I teach, I've been teaching art at Rikers Island since 2018. Um, <laughs> right now, I'm in the mental observation unit as a part of my internship, 16 hours every week, which is completely different from working with young adults, which is what I'm used to. Um, but by God's grace, I'm still standing. And um, yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. I'm a mom. I have a 13-year-old boy. And I just got married last year, this year. Oh. <laughs> 
I feel like I've been married for a long time. <laughs> no, but um, that's pretty much it. And so the work is has a lot to do with community. It has a lot to do with people, real people. Um, this is Leisha Garner, Eric Garner's sister, who um, she like basically it's making the work with the blessing of the people who the work is about, but then also like saying, okay, how can this serve you? And sometimes it's a print that can help raise money. Sometimes it's a, a banner for a protest. Sometimes it's just showing up when they're in need. Um, this is in Newark uh, on 545 Hawthorne Avenue. Different mothers and um, mothers specifically who lost their children due to police brutality, but we wanted to include people from the community and they felt like gun violence was a more prevalent issue. So we have three moms from Newark who are featured in this piece. Um, we could go to the next one. That's a uh, young George Floyd in the arms of his mom. So there's an ongoing body of work. It's, it's called Every Mother's Son or Every Mother. And essentially, it's just portraying different people as their younger self because around the time that Trayvon Martin was killed, I realized that half of the United States thought that Zimmerman was correct in his actions. And so I was really trying to figure out how to twist the mindset of those people to see it the way I saw it. And so we were talking about a mother's loss of a child being a more universal situation. Um, this is me working with Street Theory Gallery. So that painting became a part of a mural that's permanent in Boston now. Um, Say Adams and Marka, really, really great individuals who I consider my mentors. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. Okay, this is, uh, this is right across the street from Barclays Center, or the finished version of it. Um, that's Eric Garner as a child, that's his sister. Leisha, who you saw in the last picture, and that's their other brother, Emery, who actually died due to gun violence when he was really young. Um, and that's, oh, I thought I was done. So, and then also back to 2020, um, we were, uh, I was commissioned to design the word lives in the Foley Square um, street mural. And I kind of used it as an opportunity to bring everything I care about in one place. So there's some dedication to the Panthers, there's some scripture, specifically about, you know, removing the tears from our eyes, et cetera, from the Bible. This is Amherst Emery Douglas, who was the artist for the Black Panthers newspaper. And then um, and there are some mothers um, that I've had the privilege of working with featured in that one. And then this is just because I go to church with a lot of people from Ghana and Nigeria. And so, and then that's the finished piece. I didn't paint it. There were other artists that were commissioned to paint it, thank God, because I don't like working on my knees at all. Um, but the design was there, and it's since faded, like most of those, which I think they could have done a better job of picking better paint, but that's another story. And I'm done. <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much uh, for those presentations. Um, I have some questions that I, I've prepared uh, about your work, and uh, we also have a, a mic here. So if people have questions they'd like to ask, we do ask that you, you just come up to the mic. Uh, it's being recorded, is my understanding, and so uh, if if you want to speak from your seat, uh, please instead get up to the mic. But uh, I'd like to begin by asking it, you all if you could uh, please answer this question. It, talk to us about your your preferred medium and why you choose to, to work with what you work with. <laughs> uh, how, how do we do this? Should um, we start at one you, end? You start sure. Mine. Okay, we'll point it at me. <laughs> point it to me. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Okay, let me put that to you. Okay. Um, so for me, as of up until now, um, paint has been my preferred medium. Why? I don't know. That's the first thing that I ended up playing around with when I started getting into art. Um, I do really love printmaking. 
Um, I'm in a sculpture. I'm in an undergrad sculpture class right now. I'm the oldest person in the class. Um, but I really do want to add dimension to my work. Uh, from an art therapy standpoint, um, now I understand why painting was extremely important for me. Um, scientifically, there are things that happen in the human brain when you are doing repetitive activity that you enjoy. And that thing can reverse the negative effects of trauma um, and what trauma does to your brain. And so, um, you know, I grew up, I didn't grow up in a traumatic or any type of abusive experience, but I did experience um, physical domestic abuse when I was uh, about to become a mom or when I was pregnant. And I realized that the work as service and the last 13 years of my life, it started around that time. And so though I'm like emerging and striving to become an art therapist, I realized that God had his own way of using art as a therapeutic way for me to heal, get through, and somewhat somewhat process um, those experiences. And I, yeah, I'm just kind of learning more about that as I'm in school, and now I love painting even more. Um, but the same thing goes for knitting, anything that's like a repetitive motion that you enjoy to do. So that's why it's paint for me. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm gonna be the least traditional answer because of where I work. Um, you know, it's interesting, like in some ways the media at Four Freedoms is community. It's all of the people we work with who determine the form of the thing we're gonna make. But also, you know, some of what I alluded to that the things we're making are always changing has had to do with acknowledging some sort of urgent crisis and feeling like there was a need to solve it. So. Like I said, the organization started as a super PAC, thinking about what it looked like to have money in politics. And then, you know, in 2018, we created a 50 state initiative where we created a network with uh, creatives in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. And there was this idea that, you know, our information was so siloed that our communities felt so disparate. And how do we create a network that feels like nationwide? And then in 2020, we were talking about this feeling of like, it, feeling far away from each other. And we had this Congress in LA that was the largest creative convening of creative professionals where we brought people together. And then in the 2020 election, as it felt existential and there was this like lack of joy, we sort of birthed the wide awakes and put forward this idea of civic joy rather than civic responsibility, the capacity to like find joy in your participation. And then in the last like year, we've been experimenting with For Freedoms News as we're thinking about our like broadcast news as being incredibly toxic and everybody feeling really burnt out on the information they're getting and we're asking what would it look like if artists created the news? What would the stories we heard be if artists made the news? And actually a lot of the people here have participated in Four Freedoms News and it was some of the most inspiring stuff I've ever seen. Molly, when we had you on for Four Freedoms News, you talked about power hates to have images of it and that has been something that like Mm -hmm. As an organization, we all felt bowled over by that we gave artists this platform to talk about either current things that were in current events or things that weren't in the news and what would, it, what would it look like if we told those stories. And for you to talk about the capacity for artists to shine light on power was like, for every one of us felt like ding, 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 ding. That's what it looks like to like shift your medium, be curious about solving new problems and have artists like meet that curiosity with innovation. So yeah, I mean, everything always changes for us, but it's about finding new ways to solve problems that we didn't even know we were gonna have. Thank, thank you so much. I often think that as an artist, our style comes as much from what's wrong with us as what we're good at. <laughs> and it comes from like where we're kind of broken, you know, messed up, jagged. And one of the things I would say that's wrong with me is that I'm a profoundly impatient person. Mm -hmm. And so the first medium that I really loved was just a pilot pen on a piece of paper because I could draw fast. Mm -hmm. I could draw on the road. A pilot pen was $2, and you can get it at a convenience store anywhere in the world, you know? And I could sit with my pilot pen. Um, if you want to make, this is gross, but if you want to make it great, go like this, you can, you know? <laughs> and. Um, I could draw what was in front of me. For me, 
drawing, the, f the first purpose of it, I've been drawing since, I, I don't even remember, probably since I could hold a pen I was drawing, was that there was this outside world that I felt so apart from and so alienated from and I, I didn't know how to make words, I didn't know, I wasn't like social or communicative, but I could draw and that was my way of grasping at it and that was what art had always been for me. It was a lockpick to get through to other people, to get into places I wasn't supposed to be, to open doors that were closed to me, to, you know, befriend that, or, you know, to impress that beautiful girl, right? And everything about my style came from that. I started out as, like, a, you know, teenager backpacking with very little money around Europe, uh, trying to draw the everything around me. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, really sharpened my skills in nightclubs and at burlesque shows where I would sit on the steps and I would just try to draw everything, you know, for beauty and also the kind of class war that only happens in a nightclub, right? I'd try to get it down as fast as I could and as accurate wow. as I could. Then when Occupy Wall Street happened, it happened right across the street from where I lived, I saw what absolute lies were about it in the media, just condescending nonsense. And I was like, no, I'm gonna go down there and I'm gonna draw it. I'm gonna draw oh. it fast, I'm gonna draw it right, I'm gonna draw it just like I was in a nightclub. And that was what gave me this addiction to drawing history as it happened. Oh. Just sitting there with my pen, my paper, and getting it down. And thank you so much for bringing up what I said about power not liking images. So if you notice, in a prison, they don't let photos be taken. They don't let photos be taken at a checkpoint. They don't want photos to be taken in a detention center. And the reason is, was power knows how bad it looks for them when there are visuals. Mm -hmm. Visuals break through all of the boundaries that people have. They get right to your heart. And so the only visuals power wants of those things is the one that power makes itself. But what I, as an artist, can do, right, is I can talk to people who have been through that and I could take things back from the memory hole. I could take things that weren't photographed the first time around, and I could make them visual, and I can also portray it through the eyes of the person that lived that, right? The person who endured it. For me, that's been um, one of the most important usages of my work. Uh, my first big story as like an artist journalist was I went down to Guantanamo Bay. And the only reason I got permission for this was that they thought I was like a stupid little girl. and. Uh, there was no, there was no other reason. I was, uh, perhaps this is the advantage of being, you know, a youngish woman. You get underestimated, and that can help you sometimes. And what I did was I drew all of these things that the military made it almost impossible for photographers to get. Everything from like force feeding chairs to wow. the sort of grim circus of their courtroom. Uh, I would draw I on construction sites in Abu Dhabi where there were you know, workers who um, were basically indentured servants. I did another piece about these uh, amazing, amazing men who were incarcerated in Pennsylvania who uh, organized a protest against torture in their prison okay. and were um, falsely accused of rioting while they were in solitary confinement. I think we can all see the Alice in Wonderland logic of this, mm -hmm. rioting as a group activity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> uh, so, and I, I drew, I got like leaked footage of what those horrific and just skin crawlingly evil raids looked like um, from, from a source and I drew those to show people, mm -hmm. right? Now, I, I was so moved by everything you said, Sophia. I just, what a beautiful speech. Um, but one of the many things that you said that struck me was how you use the medium, right, that is actually, that is of service, that gets the job done, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I do that as well. Like so, a lot of times, um, what it looks like is the drawings that I showed you. But sometimes it looks like uh, me painting a banner for the Democratic Socialists of America for them to uh, try to get some good rent laws passed, right? And that's you know canvas and paint because that's what you use for that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it looks like painting a big old mural on a wall. It's what gets the job done, but I think that at the heart of everything that I do, and I try to be better about it, it's still like get it fast, get it hard, get it true, just like you're sitting on the steps of a nightclub. Thank you. That's okay. great. Um, you know, I have to, my, my first response was the exact same thing that Carly said as community. Mm -hmm. um, working together, you know, in social sculpture, um, you know, building um, together, um, and just the, just the, the, 
the strength that we feel together, the hope I spoke about before, um, the camaraderie is really important. Um, and then the group of friends that have grown from, you know, me just inviting artists initially whose work I admired and participating in, in these events that I have organized everywhere. I just basically started, in, and from other states, and asked them to come join me, and people started coming. So now we have this sort of group of artists that, that work together a lot that has is born from that. So really, it is the camaraderie um, and the hope and the joy that's generated. But also, um, in the physical making of work, I usually, uh, my, my me the medium that's most important is sort of, is the whatever concept I'm working on. So initially, um, one of my first big bodies of work was uh, right after 9-11, and I started collecting the items confiscated from people at the airport. It took me a long time to get acquire them from SFO, San Francisco. Um, but I was really interested in what they symbolized and what they meant and how I could um, reconfigure them and assemble them in a way that, that would portray that to sort of really um, inspire, ignite um, conversation and responses. So that's sort of one example. I've used everything from um, birth control pills to um, uh, gas hoses with the nozzle. Um, so I use a lot of different it, cell phones, a lot of different materials, and it's really about whatever um, idea I'm, I'm trying to, um, you know, present is what ends up being the, the most important medium. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for, for me, it's, it's kind of similar. I was, uh, I studied painting in uh, school. I want to say studied painting. It's not like, I didn't learn how to paint in school. <laughs> I think that's one of the myths of art school is that, you know, <laughs> they, they, they teach you to paint. And I, I'm an I'm a art professor, but um, it, that's not the way it happens in the academy <laughs> um, most of the time. Uh, I didn't learn anything about painting in undergrad. Um, but I taught myself to paint uh, mostly because I had a, I was a, a cartoonist and, you know, doing sign painting, airbrushing t-shirts and cars, and, you know, that's how I paid for undergrad, was like with a lot of these commercial yeah. gigs. From a very young age, I was always, uh, uh, I was always drawing, so I've been supporting myself through my art commercially or professionally, like, since I was 19, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so then I went to school, and, you know, uh, and painting was uh, what was most immediate. Similarly, you know, a background in public art, pa in mural painting, because of um, the public messaging in murals, you know, being inspired by the Chicano muralist, and um, the Chicano, Chicano mural mu movement, especially because um, of how the storytelling of, uh, uh, of histories that are not in our history books, you know, for me was always really moving, um, and I wanted to see that more. I studied in Miami. Um, but um, what I make primarily today is sculpture, uh, and a lot of interactive sculpture. Um, and I, I go back and forth, you know, I'll choose the medium that fits the idea. And I like that flexibility a lot, but I also really love being a maker of things. And so I make a lot of things that look like they're not handmade, that look like they're, you know, they're really shiny and polished and look like they're fabricated somewhere else. But I actually like to have my hands on the work, and um, that's how it's been so far. So it's not necessarily reflected with all the work in the show, um, but if you go to, like, my site, you'll see a lot of shiny uh, <laughs> sculptures. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, that's, for me, that's the... the the medium will be determined by the idea. Thank you. Um, next question I have, and I, again, I want to remind you all to please come to the mic if you have your own questions. Um, to challenge the status quo, you need to draw attention to the, your issue with your work. Um, can you talk about where the line is, if there is a line with regard to what you will and perhaps won't do with your work? Hmm. Do I have to go first? No. <laughs> no <anybody. laughs> I think <laughs> from a For Freedom's perspective, I don't think you really know where the line is until you've crossed it. Um, there was a billboard, at For Freedom's is really well known for um, taking over billboard space and handing it over to artists. and. In 2016, there was a billboard that had um, a photo from the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and it said, Make America Great Again. And everyone was outraged. Like, lefties were outraged, and conservatives were outraged, and everybody thought it was an attack on them. And the organization, like the founders of the organization, were kind of thrilled 
that there was all of this outrage from everybody because there was this moment of collective conversation mm -hmm. and this opportunity to engage in why everybody felt so attacked by this combination of image and text and what what was it that an artist was doing and what was the opportunity for a public space like an advertising space and what we perceive that to be used for and you know we think of it as advertising space but so often particularly in the south that advertising space is purchased by ultra conservative organizations who are anti-choice and so they actually already are political spaces and so this opportunity to engage with people's outrage and to dig into like why it was that so many people felt attacked by this this like imagery i think felt like okay this is what the capacity for art is to inspire conversation and i'm actually in the very early stages of working on a project that doesn't fully have a form yet that you know we're talking about what it will look like to make some kind of collective artwork that engages with the rise of anti-Semitism. And mm. it's been one of the, I, I'm Jewish, it's been one of the like trickiest things that I've ever worked on um, because inevitably like we have this fear that as soon as we talk about anti-Semitism, people are gonna conflate that with Zionism. So how are we clear that these are two separate issues? And how are we clear that this is a response to white supremacy and also an acknowledgement that most people who are Jewish, I move through the world being presumed to be white. And so how do we engage with like these tricky things? Mm -hmm. And I think like we're in a process of testing the line. And one of the best ways that I found to do that is to invite more people in, to like to ask more people to weigh in on where they believe the line to be. And I don't know that we're gonna, I mean, I feel sure that we're not gonna find the right balance that no matter what we put out into the world, no matter how nuanced our intention is, how brilliant the artists we invite into the process, people are gonna be angry. And that mm. will, some of that will be in bad faith and some of it will be in good. And so how do you use that as an opportunity to engage with the people who actually come with, come in good faith um, mm. with their outrage? And hopefully like how do, how do I as a person who's like curating this project end up better for it and how does every artist who's a part of the project end up better for it I don't totally know but I don't think we'll find the line in advance of putting it out into the world hmm. yeah I mean I, I can think about this question in different ways because it's uh, um, I teach a course in socially engaged art in the public realm at the School of Visual Arts um, uh, in the MFA program we talk a lot about the ethics involved in public art projects mm -hmm. and, and um, the, the ethics in, in terms of how artists work with communities, right? And responsibilities, especially those who are trying to deal with issues of social justice and then become kind of the spokespersons for some of those things uh, in the process. But, um, and so I think for me, one of the, l one of the lines in, in considering this kind of work is thinking about how you, how you really have to, you know, make sure that you honor the communities that you work with, right? And uh, not be a singular speaker for an anonymous, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a, a community of participants that construct <laughs> your entire project. Um, but w there's a lot of bad practices and a lot of c uh, complicated practices, uh, to s you know, to, to be kind uh, in the art world uh, when any of that work turns into an object product in the marketplace, you know? And so here's where, for me, there are lines that get um, crossed all the time when, um, when work gets commodified. Yeah. To make that further complicated, um, as an image maker, uh, one of the things I think about a lot is what is the kind of work that I want to live around, right? Um, and even when I'm thinking about something that's very painful to, to deal with, if I reproduce the image of that pain, and the image of that problem, does that give more power to the problem itself? Does it reinforce the pain and the trauma of that image, right? Um, and, and so that's, and I think that's an important thing to think about as, as artists. Um, it becomes even more complicated when those kinds of images in one's practice become a part of a commercial world and one profits off of images of pain and suffering, especially the suffering of others. So it's, it, these are, I think, some of the ethical, the ethical uh, uh, concerns in a lot of the work that is socially uh, uh, motivated. Um, 
And for me, there are definitely lines, you know, in my own practice that I think about all the time. Um, but I think some, uh, I, going back to the way Carly was describing this in, in, in projects, especially that were, you know, uh, big projects that are engaging uh, the public in dynamic ways, I think that those lines are not always known until they're reached and crossed, and it can be messy. But, um, you know, I think this is part of how artists are also trying to explore how to also come to terms with our own trauma and our own feelings and our own rage and our own sort of frustrations, right? Um, but uh, I, I've been thinking on a personal level, I'll just speak for me, about a lot of these things lately too. Like, you know, um, there's, it's one thing to make the image of, of something painful and say this is messed up and this is what it looks like, you know, and then I, I have to be around that, you know, and, and, and wrestle with this. But I can do this other thing sometimes too, which is to produce the opposite energy. Like what is, what is, the, what is the counter energy? to that problem, right? Can I produce the solution? Can I, can I focus on, the, uh, on something that offers love and hope, right? And so I, I go back and forth with thinking about these different strategies just in terms of how to balance my own energy, <laughs> you know, um, in, in the process. So it's, it's, a, it's a negotiation, I, I think, when it comes to, you know, uh, painful issues. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's not a real, uh, you know, complete answer <laughs> one way or the other, but I think that those lines are always always in front of us. Thank you. Sophia, you were here. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what you were saying. Um, I do think that for me, it's, it's kind of been this approach of making things that are very, very beautiful and attractive, and then when people get really close, they see the pain or they understand the pain behind the face, but I do think that I do have a responsibility to not recreate more like you were saying of the things that I don't want to see happening especially just like from the creative standpoint like I do think that we have the power to create a world as it should be and not just um, combat the things that are in front of us at all times so there was I don't know if I've crossed the line yet I think I really want to but I want to find a way to do it anonymously so that way I can <laughs> keep my family and all these other things that are connected to me intact. Um, I've always imagined myself being somewhat, well, not the scandal part of Olivia Pope's life, but that gladiator team where it's like, okay, this is what's happening. This is what needs to get taken care of. This is everyone's job. Get it done, but creatively. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. Um, mm -hmm. So... There was one, there are two instances. So I've been kicked out of the Whitney, no, the Guggenheim Museum before um, for, uh, it was a, a interactive art piece. It was literally called Draw Free and whatever I was drawing, they didn't want to see. And so I got escorted out. Ouch. Um, and it just had something to do with, again, just portraits of political prisoners and their names. It wasn't much. Most people probably wouldn't even know who that was. Um, but I did do it in whiteout, but they didn't have any rules. So I guess that that was one moment where I realized, like, okay, this is actually something. And then um, I think about this. I did a performance piece once. So I'm a roller skater. I'm a second-generation roller disco roller skater. Woo! And wow. um, <laughs> my dad grew up in the rink, and he put us wow. on skates as soon as we could walk. And so there is uh, this anti-police brutality piece called Please, I Got Dreams. And it starts off with it basically skating routines. When you when you learn a routine, you do it over and over and over again. And so it was looking at these issues as cycles that keep happening over and over again. And then it breaks out into a freestyle one by one. It's four people, and we're wearing shirts that are saying what's happening from mass protests to no indictment or whatever, whatever the norm is. And then there's a second set of shirts that reveal what we would like to see happen. Clearly, officers indicted and immediate end to police brutality, not one more death. And um, that was done for the first time as a flash mob at the first Saturday at the Brooklyn Museum. There was one person who knew we were gonna do it, who was cueing the music, and everybody else said we couldn't do it unless we had like a million dollars worth of insurance. But somehow, some way, we managed to do it and finish before security really understood why there was a crowd. <laughs> um, and so I love moments like that. I live for moments like that. I think pieces like that should exist in front of the precincts where these officers work and, and things of that nature. But again, I think there's a level of backing that would be needed to pull off something like that in a way that you know allows me to 
like you said, some people sacrifice everything. And when you have a family, there's a lot more on the line. So that's what I wanted to add. One thing, I, I wouldn't say it's like crossing a line, but one thing that I, I just hate and that I just strive not to do myself is that very often uh, when people are talking about like a marginalized group of people or people who are you know, oppressed, uh, you know, refugees, you know, pe just people who are having the boot on them, they talk about them like they're children. They talk mm. about them like they're these saccharine, twee, little perfect angels who are so helpless and they just need like, I don't know, someone to give them a fucking hug. And I hate it. I hate it so much. I, when I uh, do work about, let's say, my, my last book, which I worked with a Syrian journalist to do, one of the things that we were both fighting for was to show the people that he grew up with in Raqqa as the tough, funny, cynical, sometimes kind of hustlers and scammers even, you know? Mm. People th that were complicated, like they actually were, you know, that had, that were invested with our work with the same, you know, sort of humanity and uh, complexity and even messed up inness that you would invest, that you would invest like an American when you're writing about them with. And I think that there's something so objectifying and so dehumanizing about trying to turn people into these like child angels just because they're oppressed and it's something that I um, would gladly wipe out of all activist art. Um, I have to follow up a little bit of what Miguel was talking about, thinking about where, you know, how far you push an idea and, you know, who or what group or what people you may um, unknowingly, you know, offend. So that's really important to be aware of and tuned into. Um, you know, as a white woman, for me, it's and has been really important to be intersectional feminist um, in all the work I do and the thinking. So it's, it's sort of, it's not as much what, where I draw the line, but certainly not wanting to hurt um, anyone in any way. But you know, and to be inclusive is really important. Um, and but as far as I will go, um, I will go f far. I mean, I don't know if I, <laughs> yeah, I will. I mean, as far as where I draw the line, I don't. I mean, that would be the only line. Otherwise, you know, I think um, why I also sometimes work very large is, is the impact um, where that can potentially, or work, working with Four Freedoms, where it's a, you know a nationwide. Um, projects where I think it has an even stronger um, presence and so um, you know I have a, a friend oh people know Trevor Paglin I mean he he shot up a, um, a satellite <laughs> as an art project I mean you know so it's sort of like uh, and, and in many ways if in, in thinking in that way I don't I don't have any boundaries <laughs> uh -oh. And then after we're done here, we're going to go over to the museum and see some of the work. Uh, but the question I have here is, there is today uh, a heightened awareness that who a person is, their identity and background and experiences qualify or disqualify them to be an advocate for a subject. I mean, can you talk about how who you are has informed what you feel you can or cannot say as an artist? I have a question. Do we have a five minutes for this question, or does the <laughs> is it, does the audience like get to ask any questions too? Is that oh, I would love. Uh, I would okay. I would forfeit my question to the audience. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Not that it's not a good question, but um, yeah. I didn't want to not give the audience a chance to right, ask questions. Right. Five minutes might not be enough. Time yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> That's a deep one. <laughs> this is so formal here. This is mainly inspired by, by Molly. I mean, you could have named this whole thing Five Activists. I mean, come on. You're an activist. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 if you looked up the Jimmy, in the Jimmy Thesaurus artist, the first thing would be activist. I mean, you're adding to the world. You're trying to change the world. Uh, that is what an activist does. Mm. So you're an activist. Don't say that anymore. <laughs> Any other questions?
questions? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> and can I just add here? Just uh, for, I don't. I just want to say this before we leave because for to to be in a show like this, it, so university galleries sometimes can take different risks than other kinds of galleries, right? And um, and I always love that because um, they're they're off, and they're not always smaller, but they're 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 more independent often in the way that they can um, create shows. And when I was a young artist, like I always wanted to be in shows like this with artists like this. And it was it was rare that I got to see shows <laughs> like this as a young artist. And so and I'm just realizing that every time that I have a chance to be in a show with other artists who I think of as activists and who I think of as being so radically committed to social justice around, you know, across a range of, uh, of ideas. These are the artists that I wanted to see growing up, but that I so rarely saw in any museums or galleries. So I just had to say that because it's, 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 it's always like for me a huge honor to be in this kind of company and to, you know. to have gotten to a place where um, not just personally, but to, to, to see that there are shows like this, that there is, there is collective interest in creating space for these ideas to be e explored and expanded and engaged with so that you know, the public and other audiences can, can take this and run with it in, in another way, right? So that the work is not static, but living, you know? I mean, I, one of the things like, I, to build on that that I so appreciate is how many, how all of us have, um, broken out of the confines of an art world that sometimes wants to take our work and put it like butterflies under glass, right? Like your work is out in the streets and it is like viscerally engaged with people's lives and it's done in collaboration with people. I mean, I was I was so moved by the way. I, I, I hadn't been introduced to your work before and I'm so grateful for learning about your work from this. I, I love it. And Miguel, I, I have this memory of you at, it was at, um, La Fiesta de Luisa in um, El Barrio. <laughs> and he, this, this man has a piragua cart in addition, which is like this type of, you know, uh, Puerto Rican ices. And I remember him with this look of like total joy, like, you know, fist bumping and like giving high fives to everyone because they all know him for his awesome piraguas that's like all decorated with his art. And I'm like, this is so real deal, right? Like this mm. guy paints like the wind and then he's also out in the streets with piraguas at once. It shows that <laughs> art is part of life, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like the stuff of life. Yeah. And they can be joyful. It can be mm -hmm. joyful. I love that in Michelle's presentation too, just like radical joy, as a as a political action, right? Absolutely. As, a, and so, like all of these are modalities of resistance that we are offer in different visual languages and different vocabularies, but we also live, I I, I think, a life that tries to also uh, increasingly think about joy as resistance, right? As a, as 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 a political action and reclaiming that, and I'm sure trying to do that more. Uh, and I hope you are too. I have I have to just um, add to what you're saying is um, one of the things that I learned about the program here, and which I absolutely love, and, I, and it's extremely rewarding, is that there will be about thousand students coming through, and and students, I mean, uh, obviously the students here at the university, but I, I thousand students that are um, third and fourth graders, ninth graders, so you know, elementary and high schoolers. And that, to me, is extremely rewarding um, to have that kind of interaction for the, the, the kids to have that kind of interaction and to see this kind of work. Is, that's, that's why I do the work, actually, is mm -hmm. mainly for kids. And um, I mean, it, well, for everyone, but I think if, if we can affect people and if we can also touch mm -hmm. kids, I believe um, activism should be taught in, in grade school. I think that should yeah. be part of a basic curriculum for kids to learn of, of wh what to do and that they have the right or it's okay or to em you know embolden them to 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 be an activist mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so it's actually a program I'm with my daughter's school who's in um, eighth grade we're gonna do a curriculum I'm helping them with a mm, curriculum for amazing. a one-year program of art and art act art and activism from sixth grade to 12th grade so this this is what this is what I think is this is Oakland, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> Oakland School for the Arts, yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah. wow. So anyway, um. but I'd like to thank you all. Uh, <laughs> my last question was wishful thinking, and I think your closing comments were much more eloquent than uh, the question. So anyway, thank you again, and thank uh, you. please join us.
at the uh, museum, and we'll be walking uh, across the way there, where you can see the the work with the the artists. You'll all be there. Thank yes. you. Thank you. I love watching. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.